three, as I mentioned before, there's one verse in, in the Holy Quran, which is in chapter eight, which says that go out and find them and wherever you can find them, chop off their heads. This is not the meaning of a verse of Quran. First thing is that such all these verses regarding um, the use of sword are verses which are referring to war, defensive wars. And in, in the act of war, obviously there is going to be some and have to be some fighting. But all the wars in Islam have been defensive, not offensive. So these verses are instructing and were instructing uh, Muslims that if they have to fight, then they're going to have to fight. But equally, the same verses turn around and say, but do not transgress. So that means, for example, the verse which is commonly quoted, that uh, wherever you find them, go out and kill them wherever you find them. But they don't quote the verse before, those who fight you that those who want to fight you, this verse is about permission was given to Muslims after 13 years of persecution. Then God gave Muslims permission. Now you can fight those who want to fight you. But this was only in defense, not in offense, on the offensive. So some of these radicals like ISIS and so forth may take these verses and twist them uh, into their own ideology, but actually, after if you read, after mentioning all that I have just shown, there's nowhere in the Quran where permission has been granted for Muslims to go and kill innocent human beings. It is absolutely forbidden. We do not have that right to do that. But to fight in defence, that is obviously had to be the right of the early Muslims because otherwise. The, the Quraysh, the, 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 the pagan Arabs at that time wanted to finish Islam. So like all other prophets of God, Abraham included, Moses and Joshua, they all had to fight uh, defensive wars and some of them they had to fight to survive. But uh, the use of the sword, I, I don't like this use of the sword. And you see the Saudi Arabia flag where it has a sword written and it has the kalma, I don't like it because it gives the wrong impression. It gives the impression that Islam is a religion which uses the sword, uh, but this is not at all the teachings of Islam whatsoever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because it's a, it's a question that that I actually met when I was organizing this this seminar. Any questions? Any? I know that. Um, in Islam, there are some mistakes. Um, from your experience, do you think that in Islam um, you still have these mystics living today? Okay, look. Um, I know that there are some mystics, myst mysticism, mystic people. In Sufis, oh, okay, sorry. In, in Islam, do you think that there are still um, uh, Sufi, Sufi um, uh, Islam living today? Um, yes, there is. Uh, um, certain Muslim communities who follow Sufism. And they're quite far and spread all over the Muslim world. Um, for example, you have um, in Pakistan and in India, there are certain Sufi orders which practice Sufism. They're still there. That's what you wanted to know, if they're still practicing Uh, 
No, but what, what you, you mean, I, I don't understand what, what the point you want to make in your question. From Sufism. No, she's saying, she's, yeah. saying that she's proposing that could there be meetings between between the Sufis? radicals and the Sufis? No, no, the Sufis and Christian mystics and the Jewish mystics. Okay, I understand your point. Yeah, sorry, this is what I was not understanding. There were meetings between these persons who have a spiritual dimension and other spiritual dimension. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, um, yes. I mean, I would have to say yes. Um, if there are um, Muslim organizations who are Sufis and, and Christian organizations who are mystic and Sufism also in that way, and Judaism, and they all can come together and create a path to peace, why not? It should happen. Um, our own community, uh, in its true sense, is, a, is of a very highly spiritual level. Whether you want to call them Sufis or mystics, they can, we can be called that. In every Muslim community, because there are, they are of course other denominations within Islam, you will find many individuals who are very um, Sufistic in character. And there'll be those who are very conservative and those who are very liberal. In, in Islam, you'll find many within many communities of different levels. I think what's actually needed is not just whether the mystics or the Sufis should come together. What should happen is that the Muslim leaders themselves need to come together and they need to sit down and they need to talk with other religious leaders as well. That's what needs to happen. Now the head of our community, he, His Holiness, Hazrat Khalifa al the V, he has been, for the last 10 years or more, going around the world, meeting with political and religious leaders. He's been urging them to come down and sit and talk and bring peace to the world. In fact, he's the only Muslim leader, last 10 years, he has been starting this work. He has spoken in Washington. He has spoken in, Cap in Capitol Hill in Washington. He has spoken in Brussels in the European Parliament. He spoke in the House of Parliament in London. He has spoken in my own country in Dal Éireann, the House of Parliament in Ireland, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Canada. He is doing this work and he actually, um, if you see his photograph, I think is maybe in the book. Um, is it in? I mean, just to show you him, you see he, is not a Sufi in that he's not belonged to a Sufi order as such, but he is by nature, by character, by his personality, is very spiritual, highly spiritual. He loves humanity and he puts humanity first. He's not interested just about preaching about you must accept Islam or you have to accept Islam. No, he is, first he begins by explaining that the world must come together. Of course, he believes that Islam is that faith which will bring mankind towards a universal peace. And the, one of the reasons is because the very founder of our community, Hazrat Muzaffar Ahmad of Ghadian, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, he has proclaimed to be that very second coming of Christ, that second advent of the, of the coming which is expected. He has claimed to be that Mahdi which, which the Muslims are waiting for. And his job was to, to bring the whole of mankind back on that path towards peace and towards worshipping one God. And to do that, you, you have to reach out to the whole of mankind. And that's what he has been doing. So it, it's not a case of 
just Sufism. It's a case of bringing everyone onto that table. For example, His Holiness Pope Francis is amazing, amazing personality. Pope Francis and His Holiness Hadri Khalifa Tal Masih, the fifth, may Allah give him and strengthen his hands. My prayer is that, that they should meet, that they should come together, that they should go out to the world and they should together tell the world you have to sit down and you have to talk and you have to have this dialogue. That's how it's going to have to happen. And this is the beginning of all this. This is how it begins. I mean, I'm, I was contemplating, I didn't do it yet, but I was contemplating on writing to Pope Francis and asking him that is it possible that you could meet with His Holiness and have this dialogue? Because that's what's going to need. Now, now we need the world spiritual leaders to come together as one unit to tell the world, look, you're going to have to have peace. So I agree with you in your, your concept and your understanding. Um, everyone should come, not just Sufis, whether they're conservatives, radicals. We have to invite the radicals. We have to sit them down and, ex and speak to them and give them that platform also that we bring them to a peaceful means of living their life. One of my big worries is how can one reconcile the word jihad, the holy war, with the peace that um, Muhammad has been um, preaching? Well, uh, first of all, um, the word jihad has to be understood on its real meaning. Because the word jihad comes from an Arabic word which is, which is called jihada. And it simply means to strive, to make an effort to do something. So jihad, by the radicals, the militants, have been taken to its extreme. And now it has become a byword for terrorism that they are going out to do jihad. And when you use the word jihad, people immediately think killing, burning, raping, all, all these images come into the minds of the non-Muslim world. But they have hijacked this word. This is not the meaning of it. It means to strive, to make an effort. And actually, once Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, after he came back from a defensive war, he turned to his companions, he said, now we have to do Jihad Akbar, the greatest Jihad. Now this is the meaning of Jihad. When the companions asked, what is that Jihad? He said, the Jihad of, of um, self-reform. The Jihad of reforming oneself from abstain, abstaining from evil, from evil actions, to promoting love, peace, tolerance, and all these things he mentioned. He said, this is the real jihad. And he said, this is the hardest jihad. So this is the thing. Jihad is an Arabic word which, which can be used in different ways. It is, jihad does mean to strive. So it simply means that when, in those days when, when the Prophet called people to jihad, he, he obviously meant sometimes the jihad of defensive wars, strive to make an effort. But as I just mentioned, he made it clear that the greatest jihad and the most important jihad is the jihad of the self-reform. This is it. I mean, the thing is, look, I'll give you this example. If you can imagine 1500 years ago, 300 men, out of that 300 men, maybe eight, nine, maybe ten maximum were in any way trained to fight. The rest were farmers or merchants. They had no idea about war. They were not soldiers. But in front of them was an army of more than a thousand and beyond a thousand of well-trained Quraysh army whose only intention 
was to wipe out the infancy of Islam. Islam was not established to fight wars. Islam was established to create peace. Its meaning means peace. Salam, Islam, peace. That's why Allah said that this day I have perfected your religion for you. After he had given all the commandments, he had given all the teachings, then he said to the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him, this day I have perfected your religion for you and I have called it Islam, the religion of peace. So, unfortunately, Muslims at that time were forced into having to defend their very lives. And of course, it, it was their right to defend their lives. Just like any of us would not allow anyone in their homes to harm our families, we will stand our ground in our home and defend our loved ones. Same was the case with Islam. So, his life, I mean, he would, you know, many descriptions of him, uh, one I wanted to share with you, uh, just as an example. Once Hazrat Aisha woke up in the middle of the night, and being his wife, she reached out in, in the bedroom to her hand on the, uh, on the left or right, I can't remember, but she reached out and she couldn't find the Prophet in the bed. So she got up to find out where he had gone. She found him out in the courtyard and he was praying in deep prayer and he was praying to God Almighty to help him to bring people to, his, to, to worship God Almighty, to love God Almighty, to live their lives in a moral, righteous way. So his, his desire was only peace. His desire was only to bring mankind to worshiping God Almighty. That was his desire. But unfortunately for him, he had been a prophet, and then obviously an Islamic state, I mean, not in the Islamic state that we have the images of today, a civil a society, he had to take leadership both uh, spiritually, administratively, and even, I won't use the word politically, but he had to deal with political leaders. But his aim has always been to establish peace. So therefore, this jihad word has to really be understood. Uh, and then if it's really understood, you'll find that his life was nothing but peace. At what time, what ferry are you, are you catching back home? Uh, I think that's just one more question. Why do you think that Arab Spring took place in different Arab countries? The Arab Spring. Uh -huh. Because of internet. <laughs> after, uh, after winter, there's spring. Can I, can I take the Fifth Amendment? No? Um, Look, to be very honest with you, I am not a political person. I'm not a politician. And I try to keep as far as away as I can from political issues. Mainly because I'm a religious person. I want to follow the path of God. And therefore, all my, all my family in my mind is humanity. I'm not interested in, in, in governments and things like this. There's all different speculations about what happened to the Arab Spring and how it happened. Some people say it's impossible that suddenly in one month there was peace amongst the Arab lands and then very quickly it kicked off and there was wars fighting all over the Middle East. Some say it was started by political movements who wanted to bring down certain regimes they're all theories. Some say it was America, some say it was Britain. We really don't know. And I'm not the one going to be pointing at, yes, it was this country, yes, it was that country. Oh, but I will say this much. The one thing I will say, and I have been saying it, I've been very frank about it, 
is the very countries who are claiming to be the peacemakers, uh, peacemakers were not doing justice on those countries, choosing which country to go into and which country not to go into. For example, in Syria, certain countries decided to go into North Africa to help and aid to bring down certain political leaders, but in other countries, they've kept out of it. So that's not justice. Right now, Syria, as an example, needs intervention. It needs intervention. Maybe not by Western countries. And why I say that is because if America or Britain decides to go into Syria tomorrow, many uh, people in the world will say, you're interfering in sovereign countries. What should happen is that Muslim countries should go into those countries. Muslim armies, Muslim governments should say to, under, maybe under the banner of the United Nations, and say and try to bring peace within these Arab countries, so that these Arab countries don't turn around and say, well, you are invading our country. No. And this is actually a teaching of Islam in that way that uh, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, has said, and the Quran has also said, that if you see a nation oppressing another nation and you don't do anything about it, you will be answerable to God Almighty. And that means there's a rule, there's a condition in this. That means if I'm a Muslim country and I see another Muslim country being oppressed or violated, I should go into the aid of that person and remove that oppression. But the moment I remove that oppression, I leave. I don't go in and say, well, I'm staying here now, I've helped you, and now I want this from you, and I want that from you, and I'm going to take this from you. No. You go in, you bring peace to that country, you bring stability to that country, then you come out. That's the teaching of Islam. So that's what I mean. I mean, like I said, Syria at the moment, and Iraq is now also going to get worse. You know, something should be done about it. But I believe it should be Muslim, Muslim countries, Muslim, Muslim governments, Islamic governments should turn around and say, okay, we're ready to go in and we're ready to try and bring this uh, so to some peaceful conclusion. And the only reason so that those countries don't accuse the West of interfering in their country. So that's what I think. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, I can't point fingers because I may be wrong, but I will only say that there were, there were no, there's not proper justice being done on these areas. I mean, the United Nations is a great institution. And I did a lot of work with the United Nations because uh, I did a lot of humanitarian work for more than 20 years. And it's a great institution. But in certain places, it has been unable to stop things because certain powers would, would not give the votes in the right place. So, you know, um, unless there's justice, as, 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 I, as I mentioned here in my address, Prophet Muhammad said that bring two people together and listen to both sides, not just to one side. And if you listen to one side and then you take action just on the bank of that one side and you go into a country and you create more injustice, rather you listen to both sides and then you try to come up with the best possible solution that both parties will have their justice done on them. That, that's what I think should have happened in, in Libya and these countries. If you don't mind, I would add something. Um, um, and to tie up with what my friend and colleague has said, I think there is already um, now an idea that there should be an Arabic regional army with Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia and all this, but I think this is a very political question because what caused the Arab, the, yes, the Arab Spring? What makes people, what, what brings about revolutions? What, in history, what brought about the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution? Uh, there are histor there are probably his historical reasons why people uh, all of a sudden revolt. There's probably uh, other others who have um, instigated a revolt for political reasons, but this this sort of thing happened. These are, I think, demographic, political, social um, um, phenomena that happen in history. 
But one, one thing that I see happen all the time in history, that as soon as a revolution happens, somebody else hijacks it. <laughs> and this has happened in the French Revolution, Russian Revolution, everywhere. Some people um, take the power and transform a revolution into uh, even a worse uh, dictatorship or um, whatever you have. So I think this is more a political sort of political uh, sort of question and needing a political answer rather than uh, what we have been uh, talking about today. Thank you. Well, may, uh, may this seminar be followed by other initiatives and interfaith dialogue. May it not be a cry in the wilderness. May we have the courage to speak up in favor of peace. Very often, men hold us to account for our words. But as the Imam has just said, before God, we are to give account also for our silence. The Imam started with a prayer, singing it. I'm not going to sing this prayer because I am of tune. <laughs> but uh, I have to, to end with a reflection. We have been talking of Allah, of God, and of peace. God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn.